<laughs> so today I'm going to talk about the number of maximal independent sets in the Hamming cube, and this is joint with Jeff Kahn. And let me start with some definitions and notation first. We write QD or the D dimensional Hamming cube. And I think it's quicker to introduce some example first. For example, Q3, three-dimensional Hamming cube, looks like this. So it has eight vertices, and this vertex corresponds to 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and etc. So in, in general, in QD, the vertices are the, the binary strings of length d, and two vertices are adjacent if only if they differ in exactly one coordinate. So it's easy to see that QD is bipartite, and the bipartition is unique. V is E union O, where E is the set of even vertices, where an even vertex is a vertex with even number of ones in its coordinates, and O is similar. And then what's the number of vertices of QD? Yes, yeah, 2 to the D. And we'll, we'll use big N for the number of vertices of QD. And we'll use small n for the number of general graphs not hyper not hypercube okay and we use miss g for the number of maximal independent sets in a graph g so big mis is maximal independent sets and small mis is the number of maximal independent sets in a graph g Okay, then we are ready to state our main theorem. Our main theorem says that the number of maximal independent sets in QD is asymptotic to 2 times d times 2 to the n over 4 as d goes to the infinity. And this quantity looks mysterious at this moment. So my plan for today is, first, I will introduce some heuristics and background to understand why this is a natural, uh, natural candidate for this quantity. And then we'll talk about proofs if, uh, as time allows. Okay. Okay. Are there? I can you mean that the ratio between left hand side and right hand side Yes, exactly. Okay, and are there any questions? Okay, so let me start from a very, very general context. I chose this example because it gives a big picture, but I want to I wanna emphasize that it, this example has nothing to do with our proof. So in 1976, Erdős, Kleitman, and Rothschild proved that almost all triangle-free graphs are bipartite. So in other words, it says that if we say this is the family of triangle-free graphs, then there is a typicality in this family, which means a typical member of this family is a bipartite graph. Okay, so here almost all means all but little or one fraction of the of the family. Okay, then this typic what what does this typicality has to do have to do with this asymptotic enumeration? Notice that this theorem is equivalent to saying that the number of triangle-free graphs is asymptotic to the number of bipartite graphs. Right? So to find the asymptotic number of triangle-free graphs, it suffices to find the asymptotic number of bipartite graphs, which is much easier to analyze. Okay? 
So as a corollary of this theorem, they showed that log is 2 of the number of triangle free graphs is asymptotic to n squared over 4. And you can see that this is an easy lower bound for the number of bipartite graphs on n vertices, right? Because this quantity corresponds to subsets of these complete bipartite graphs, which of which each part is size n over 2, right? So 2 to the n squared over 4. n squared over 4 is the number of edges between those two parts. And so the number of subsets, the number of subgraphs of this bipartite graph is 2 to the n squared over 4. So this. I'm sorry? So as I said, this is a trivial lower bound for the number of bipartite graphs on n. And what's surprising is this lower bound is actually asymptotically true for log of the number of triangle free graphs. So this is a surprising result. Okay? So as I said, this only gives a big picture. So what we are going to do is let's say this is the family of maximal independent sets in QD. Then what we are going to do is to find some typical member of this family. And then we'll count the number of these typical members. It's easier to analyze, but eventually it will give us this value, which is asymptotic of this quantity. Okay. Okay, then let me introduce one more example, which is more closely related to our actual result. In 1983, it's too hot. Korshinov and Skaposenko proved that the number of independent sets in QD, so this is the number of independent sets. The number of independent sets in QD is asymptotic to 2 times, square root of e times 2 to the n over 2. And actually, this is again a trivial lower bound for the number of independent sets in QD because QD is bipartite as I said here, and the size of each part is n over 2. And because this is bipartite, any subset in this part is an independent set. So from here, we have 2 to the n over 2 independent sets. Okay? Then where does this come from? We have two because we have two parts. So what this extra term says is that there are more independent sets than this construction. Namely, it's easy to see. We, we can choose some vertices here and some vertices here so that there are no edges between those two vertex sets. Then this is, again, an independent set. And they say that the number of such, I mean, the contribution of such independent sets as, is as big as this much. Okay, and so this is the picture. So let's say this is a family of independent sets in QD. Then first, some of them are completely odd, which means they consist of odd vertices, as we saw here, and some of them are completely even, which means they consist of completely even vertices. And what they said is that the other vertices, the other independent sets are not so different. They showed that some of them are mostly odd, which means, as you expect, most of the part, most of the set, most of the vertices are from 
O and there are a few vertices from E. And there are no edges between those two sets. So combining them, it's again an independent set. Mostly odd independent set. Okay? And also they showed that there are this is what this is not what they showed. Of course, there are some independent sets which are mostly even. And what they said is this is almost everything. So this is not so trivial because you know when we choose a random sub random subset, not independent set, a random random subset from Q D, then typically half typically half of them are even and half of them are odd, right? But in the universe of independent sets, this does not happen. Mostly they're odd or even. OK, so when we look at this picture, they're either odd or even. And in this case, we say that this family has two phases, which means, so this term is from statistical physics, and I couldn't find a rigorous definition of this thing. But very roughly speaking, a phase means a thing that most of the objects that we are interested in come from. So in this case, we have two phases, odd and even. And in a phase, there are two types of configurations. Pure configurations, which corresponds to this part completely odd or completely even, and impure configurations, which means it had some flaws. So they are mostly odd, but there are some even vertices. So this, these are just definitions. And once we have those terms, then we can analyze this expression. Actually, every single term has a meaning. Here, 2 is the number of phases. And this quantity is a contribution of pure configurations in a phase. And this term corresponds to the contribution of impure configurations. Yes, exactly. So, I, so as I said, this corresponds to the contribution of impure configurations. Okay? Any questions so far? Then now let's go back to our main theorem. So here it has QD and 2 to the n over 4. And as I said, every single term has a meaning. 2D corresponds to the number of phases. And 2 to the n over 4 corresponds to the contribution of pure configurations. And it says that's it. So the contribution of impure configurations is negligible. So once we know that meaning, we know that this is strikingly nice and clean formula for this quantity. Okay. Any questions? Uh, what is the pure set? Or... OK, so we are going to, so now <laughs> the next thing that we talk about is, so we talk about the phases of maximum independent sets and pure configurations. OK, so before doing that, let's see. Let me show you why this is an easy lore about. And then we will see phases. And configurations so we say y lower bound so lower bound means I will give you a construction which gives this many maximal independent sets from the d dimensional hemi cube and notice that qd is the correct product of qd minus 1 and k2 which means we have two pieces of QD minus 1, and there is a perfect matching between those two isomorphic pieces. So for example, here, I still have this picture. Here, we have two pieces of Q2, and there is a perfect matching. 
Okay. And because this one is again the hemming tube, so there are some even vertices. So let me say squares are an even vertices in half cube QD minus 1. And there are some odd vertices. So this parity is in QD minus 1, the half cube. And because those two pieces are isomorphic, the other end of the edges have the same parity, even even or odd odd. Mm -hmm. And then let's collect all of the even edges. And let's see what happens. First of all, this collection is an induced matching. A induced matching is an induced subgraph, which is a matching. So which means this guy is matching, and there are no edges between any matching edges. Okay? And also, how many edges are in this collection? Uh, we can use big N. You know, this is QD minus 1, so the size is N over 2, N over 2. And we collected half of them, so the size, so there are N over 4 edges inside this collection. Okay? And it's easy to see that this is the maximum, maximum size of an induced matching in QD. So, let me emphasize this because we'll use it later. Okay, so because this is an induced matching, we, we, we can construct maximal independent sets in this way. First, we choose one vertex from each matching edge. Then this is an independent set. Right? Then we can extend this. We can add some vertices in this set to make it maximal. We can just add vertices until we can't. Then this becomes a maximal independent set. So in this way, we have 2 to the n over 4, at least 2 to the n over 4 maximal independent sets. Right? Because there are 2 to the n over 4 choices. And actually, this is exactly 2 to the n over 4. Again, this is easy to show that each extension is unique. But because we are talking about a lower bound, so we don't have to worry about this. Okay. Then, so from, uh, because this is important, so let me give a name to this induced matching. We are going to, we, we say, canonical, canonical matching for this type of induced matchings, which means, first, we have this decomposition, and in this decomposition, we choose one parity and collect all the edges in, with the same parity. Then we have this induced matching, and we call this type of induced matchings canonical matchings. Okay? Then how many different canonical matchings are there? First, we choose this decomposition. And for example, in Q3, there can be there are three ways of such decompositions. You know, this, this, or this. So in general, in QD, how many ways of deco decompositions are there? Yeah, there are D ways of decomposition, and we can choose this parity. So there are two times D canonical matchings, right? So from each canonical matching, we have this many maximal independent sets. So eventually, we have the number of maximal independent sets in QD is asymptotically bounded below by 2 times d times 2 to the n over 4. And I used this because there can be some overlaps. No. So overlaps between the set, of, the set of maximal independent sets produced from different canonical matchings. But okay, it's easy to show that the overlap is negligible. So asymptotically, we have this lower bound. Okay. 
Are there any questions? So now you can see what's our candidate for phases and what's our candidate for pure configurations. So actually our uh, phase will be these canonical matches. But uh, I, would, uh, I will elaborate, elaborate, later, elaborate it later. <laughs> I should have practiced. Okay, so are there any questions? So before we move on to the proof, uh, let me digress a little bit to talk about some history of this problem. So this question was, as far as I know, this question is first raised by the first Franco and Rodel. And they showed that log of Miss QD is at least n over 4. And as I said, this is an easy lower bound. So actually, they didn't show it. They just stated it. But their actual work is to show that this is about the, the upper bound of this quantity is 0.78 times n over 2. So they first they talk about log of Miss QD, which is much much cruder than the actual asymptotics for this. But also, this is a natural first step to look at if you eventually want to find the actual asymptotic of this group. So this is much cruder. And in this paper, oh, this is from 2013, and in this paper, they asked what's the truth for this quantity. And this question was answered not long after. Blinka and Khan. In, 2000, in the same year, proved that this lower bound is actually the truth for this law. Law miss QD is asymptotic to n over 4. And then they conjectured the actual asymptotics for this quantity is this. And now, this conjecture is our main theorem. Okay, then let me talk about our proof plan very lastly. This is very convenient. <laughs> Eventually I found it. <laughs> okay, so this is our plan for proof. So this is very sketchy. Which means I will skip all of the quantifiers. So first, we need two lemmas to show that actually these canonical matchings are our phases. And lemma one says that almost every maximal independent set is associated with some large induced matching. And almost every is, a, is this is a standard notation. It says all but little all of fraction. And associated means this. So when we have this induced matching, we say that a, this maximal independent set is associated with this induced matching if this maximal independent set hits every single edge in this induced matching. So where is this definition come from? This is from this configuration. And here I said large induced matching. This means the size of this induced matching is close to n over 4. As I emphasized, n over 4 is the maximum size of an induced matching in QD. And lemma 2 says that each large induced matching is close to some canonical matching. And 
the combination of those two lemmas say that the canonical matches are indeed the basis. Do you see it? Because it says that typically when we choose a maximal independent set, then it looks like this. There is a canonical matching and this typical maximal independent set hits most of the edges in this canonical matching. This is what the combination of those two lemmas say. Right? Okay, so this says that the canonical matchings are indeed phases. Then the pure configuration corresponds to this picture maximal independent sets which hit every single edge in this canonical matching. So there was the impure configuration that corresponds to maximal independent sets which hit most of a canonical matching but it misses some edge in this canonical matching. So this corresponds to the impure configurations. So to say, oh, I erased this. Our main theorem is miss QD is asymptotic to 2 times d times 2 to the n over 4. So as I said, this expression says that the contribution of impure configurations is negligible. So eventually to say that, we need this final lemma. Lemma 3 says that the number of maximal independent, oh, the number of maximal independent sets which does this is negligible, which means i.e. little r of 2 to the n over 4. So this says that the number of impure configurations is negligible, which means little of 2 to the n over 4, which is negligible compared to our main term in this expression. So that's it. Once we prove those three lemmas, then we are done. Okay. Are there any questions? Any, or did I miss anything? Okay. Then let's. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, we will see some details of these two, these three lemmas. First, lemma one. So, what lemma one says is that there is a close relationship between maximal independent sets and induced matchings, right? And this observation is rooted from this classic theorem by Moon and Moser. Uh, from 1965, but, uh, but the statement of this theorem is not directly related to our main theorem, so I will skip the statement, but instead, let me state a triangle-free graph version of this theorem. In 1993, Twitter and Tuza proved this. When G is a triangle free graph, then the number of maximal independent sets in G is, oh, let me write it here, the number of maximal independent sets in G is at most 2 to the n over 2. And the equality is, the equality holds if and only if G is a perfect matching. Namely, G looks like this. And actually, this direction, I mean, one direction is easy. If G is a perfect matching, then obviously we saw G is 2 to the n over 2. So the, the other direction is the, is the actual work. And also, what they said is this is the only extremograph for, the maxim, for maximizing the number of maximal independent sets. So this is the only extremograph. And once we have an extremal statement, then it's natural to consider a stability 
version of this extremal statement. So which means, can we say something like, so this is the question, can we say something like, uh, miss if miss g is close to 2 to the n over 2, if and only if g is close to a perfect matching. So this is a, a extremal statement, and its stability version is this. Can we say something like this? But for saying this, first we have to quantify this. But more importantly, we have to define what it means by g is close to a perfect matching. So for example, suppose we have this graph and this graph. Which one is closer to a perfect matching? We need some, you know, everybody has different opinions. So we need some, <laughs> we need some definitions. And it turned out the right definition for this stability statement is to define the size of a maximum induced matching in G. So this means maximum of size of induced matching in G is close to its maximum value, which is n over 2. And under this definition, which one is closer to a perfect matching? Yeah, the first one. Oh, yes. good. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And under this definition, again, one direction is trivial. Which direction? I'm heading toward that direction. Yeah, this direction is trivial because you know, if G has this big induced matching, then again we can do this. So in this induced matching, we can choose one vertex from each edge, and from here we have a large number of maximum independent sets. So the actual problem is the other direction. Okay. And so, so this stability result is first proved by Rabinovich in 2013, but only for bipartite graphs. So they proved if G is bipartite graph, then bipartite graphs, then this stability statement holds. And then they asked, can we say, uh, is this still true for triangle-free graphs and general graphs? which means not necessarily triangle-free. So this statement uh, corresponds to Moon and Moser theorem, which I skipped the statement. And this question was answered by Tan and myself in 2018. So we said yes to the question. Q1, Q2, and Q2. So we said we can say this stability statement for all of the triangle-free graphs and general graphs. Okay, so actually what we proved is something more stronger, something stronger. So our theorem says that the number of maximal independent sets not associated uh, with large induced matching is negligible. Then how, so this means, so we measure in this way. So let's say this is a maximal independent set. Then we can measure the maximum size of an induced matching, which uh, this maximal independence that is associated with. And when we measure the size of this maximum induced matching, if this size is smaller than something like 1 minus epsilon times n over 2, then the number of such maximal independent sets is 2 to the 1 minus big omega epsilon times n over 2. This is what we showed. So if this induced matching is not big enough, then the number of such maximal independent sets is small. And notice that this automatically implies this stability result because if G if G has small leash induced matching, then there is no way to have large number of maximum independent sets by our theorem. 
Okay. So this says that there is a close relationship between maximal independent sets and induced matrix. And once we have this theorem, it looks very natural to have this. Because that says that the number of ma the maximal independent sets which are not associated with big induced matching is negligible. So that seems like saying almost every maximal independent set must be associated with some large induced match because the maximal independent set not doing this is negligible. So this statement is natural in view of that theorem, but actually this is not direct implication of that theorem because here I said large induced matching, but this large is something like n over 2, which means this induced matching covers most of the vertices in this graph. On the other hand, here, large induced matching is n over 4, which means it only covers half of the vertices. And we never know what happens to the other half of the vertices. So lemma 1 is not direct implication of this theorem, and we had to, we had to do something extra. But, but I can say that this theorem uh, motivated the observation that that theorem motivated this observation and actually that's the starting point of this entire work. Okay, now I'm done with lemma one and are there any questions before moving on to lemma two? Is everything clear or everything is unclear so <laughs> you can't ask a question. <laughs> Okay, then let me move on to lemma two. Lemma two says that if an induced the size of an, an induced matching is close to is large. Large is close to n over four. Then this means this induced matching is close to a canonical matching. Right? And notice that this is another stability result because if an induced matching, the size of an induced matching is exactly n over 4, then we know that this is an easy fact. <laughs> so then we know that this induced matching is exactly one of the canonical matchings. So this is another stability result. And, uh, and this is somewhat mysteriously related to a classical result of Harper from 1966. So this is the starting point of this lemma. Uh, Harper proved that when A is a subset of vertex set of QD, and let's say the size of A is exactly half of this hemicube, Actually, his result covers the sets of any measure, but I added this for simplicity. And we write nabla of A for the, for, for the set of edge boundary, for the edge boundary of A, which means this is A and the set of edges between A and its complement. We call this set nabla of A, or edge boundary of A. And because the Hamming cube is an expander, which means usually a subset of QD has big neighborhood. So naturally, people are interested in what's the minimum edge boundary of a set. And Harper showed that nabla of A is minimized if and only if A is a half cube. So this is an extremal result, 
it says that the minimizer of the edge boundary is a half cube. And this is the only extremal graph. And in this case, what's the edge boundary? When A is a half cube, it looks like this. This is A, which is half cube. And this is A complement, which is another half cube. And this picture looks familiar, right? We looked at it about 10 minutes ago. There is a perfect matching between the half cubes. So the size of the edge boundary of A is yes, number two. So it says that uh, the edge boundary is minimized when A is half cube. And in that case, the, the size of the edge boundary is n over 2. Okay, and again, it's natural to consider the stability result of this extremal result. And this result is proved by uh, very good, Kalai and Naor in 2002. They proved that if the size of edge boundary is smaller than 1 plus epsilon times n over 2. So which means this the, edge, the size of the edge boundary is close to the minimum. In this case, A is close to a subcube, which means there exists a half cube C such that the symmetric difference of A and C is smaller than big O epsilon fraction of the entire thing. So it says, if the edge, so we, we are still with this condition. In this case, if the edge boundary is uh, something like it's close to the minimum value, then A is close to a half cube. Okay? And as I said, actually, Harper's theorem covers all of the sets of, set, it covers sets of any measures. And the stability version of Harper's theorem was quite popularly studied uh, area. So there are a number of results, not just for these half cubes, but all of the measures. And there are also some stability results for vertex boundaries, if you know what that is. And uh, OK. So this is the history. And our lemma 2 is somewhat, as I said, somewhat mysteriously reached here, where here is here. So now we are in this situation. This is our Hamming cube QD. And we have a partition of QD, like this. This is A, this is B, and this is not C, but W. And what, what we know is the size of A is close to N over 2 which is like here. And we know that W is small, but not terribly small. Which means we cannot ignore a contribution of W. It's not small enough to be ignored. And we also know that here, the edges between A and B. Let me call them nabla of AB. The, the number of edges between A and B is smaller than N over 2, which is the minimum edge boundary here. And our question was this. In this situation, can we still say that A is close to a half cube? Let me explain a little bit more. So here we have A, which is almost half of the set. And we know that the number of edges from A to B is small. But we have no information about the number of edges between A and W. And because W is not terribly small, so the number of such edges is much, much bigger than the number of those edges. So in this case, we cannot say that Nabla of A is small. But we know that W is quite small. 
And here, small means, let me quantify it. Small means this is at most n over n to the 0.58. <laughs> this is why I skip all of the quantifications. So this means the upper bound of, so this means nabla of w, the naive upper bound for nabla of w is n times n over, oh, I'm sorry, this is d. I'm sorry. It's d times n over d to the 0.58, much, which is much, much bigger than n. Right? So although this is smaller than the minimum value, but this can be much, much bigger than this value. So we cannot say that the, the size of the edge boundary is small. But in this case, can we still say a is close to a sub q? And surprisingly, our answer was yes. So this is our, uh, what should I say? So we proved that we can say yes. And again, mysteriously, this implies lemma 2. But I cannot explain this. OK, so I want to say that, as I said, this stability results are quite popularly studied area. And this, uh, this lemma too has its meaningful as, as, as its own. I mean, so because first notice that our result implies pretty, pretty good color in our, right? In this result, they don't have, so this means if we let W is the empty set, then this implies this result. Second, this says something about the combination of edge boundaries and um, vertex boundary, if you know what a vertex boundary is. So what this says is that if, so we don't know whether the uh, edge boundary is small, but if we know that the combination of the edge boundary and vertex boundary is small, then we can still say that A is close to a half cube. So it says something about the combination of edge boundary and vertex boundary in the heavy cube. So, so when we emailed, I, I gave you two, two abstracts. And the second abstract was about this work. OK, and are there any questions so far? Yeah. So actually, we have three lemmas, and each lem for each lemma, we had one paper. So all together, we have three papers to prove this small result. Yeah, that, that's why I, I can I can only give some sketches of our proof. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay. Then let me move on to lemma three. Lemma 3 uh, says this, and okay, I have 10 minutes, and I don't think ha I have time to give you something serious. So let me show you why. So let me give you, show you our motivations only. And I want to show you, <laughs> I want to show you why we trusted the contribution of the impure configurations is negligible. I just want to give you some feeling about that. Uh, we call that, we call this picture. We had two pieces of 2D minus 1. And we had this perfect matching. And we had some even edges and odd edges. And as I said, this is again a hemi cube. So we can draw this this way. This is bipartite, and we have even vertices and odd vertices, right? So we can redraw this picture. 
in this way. We have even edges here and odd edges here. And the front vertices are adjacent to front vertices and the back vertices are adjacent to back vertices. So actually we have two copies of the half cube. Okay, so let me erase this to make it clean. Yeah. My hand is closer than the eraser. Okay, then here, so again, our face is the set of even edges. And now we look at some uh, impure configurations, which means maximal, we look at maximal independent sets, which hit most of the even edges, but it misses some even edge. And let's say it only misses exactly one edge among all of the even edges. And I want to count the number of such maximal independent sets. And I'll show that the number of such maximal independent sets is negligible, which is little all of 2 to the n over 4. OK, are you ready? OK, then let's do this. So we'll suppose a maximal independent set misses this edge then because this is a maximal independent set then so that means at least one of its uh, neighbor must be occupied right so let's say this one is occupied occupied means this one is in this maximal independent set okay and again because this vertex is missed so one of its neighbor must be occupied okay and this vertex cannot be this because this is an independent set okay and once we have this then it kills all of its neighbors this these guys cannot be in the maximal independent set and also the neighbors of this guy cannot be in the maximal independent set so they kill many of the many of the choices then the number of such maximal independent sets is roughly speaking so first this these maximal independent sets miss exactly one edge and the number of choices for this edge is n over 4 because we have n over 4 even edges so first we choose uh, this one missing edge times then we choose those two uh, those two occupied vertices and the number of choices for this one is d because this is d regular and the number of choices for this one is roughly d actually this is d minus one but i don't care so this covers the choice for those two vertices and then so this kills these vertices and this kills those vertices but the rest of the edges has exactly two choices so we have 2 to the n over 4 minus roughly 2 the choices okay and then once we make choices for those edges then those edges the choice for those edges are automatically determined by its neighborhood right then what's this this is 2 to the d minus 2 so we have 2 to the d so we can ignore this 2 to the d 2 to the minus 2 d and d squared is negligible so we have roughly 2 to the n over 4 minus d which is little of 2 to the n over 4 so the number of such maximal independent sets is negligible and then why does this happen so this happens actually we multiplied some big quantity to find those two vertices but by paying those uh, by multiplying by paying or by finding those two vertices this many edges lose choices so this happens because Hamming cube is an expander because yeah, this vertex the set of these two vertices has big neighborhood so we have we lost a lot of choices 
And this is why we have this negligible quantity for the number of such maximal independence. Okay? Then this is a very, very, spe very, very special case. And this analysis breaks if we miss many edges. Why does that break? Because, and also, it does not expand that much. If we have one vertex, then the size of its neighborhood is d times of this, of this vertex. But if we have many, many vertices, then the size of its neighborhood is not exactly d times many, d, d, d times more than this set. So it, ex it does not expand that much. So we, our gain from this part is not as big as this single case. So here we had to do something, and what we used was, I'm not sure you still remember this name, Korshnev and Sapochenko. So they counted the number of independent sets in QB. And what they did was, so here, as I said, this analysis breaks as this set gets bigger. But they still said if we have some, if we give a restriction that that has smaller neighborhood, then the number of such sets is not so many. So we used that idea, but not exactly that idea. So we had to do something more. But yeah, it's it's almost the end. So I cannot say that. But I hope you um, acknowledge that why this analysis breaks as we have as, as we miss many edges and even edges. Okay, so I think I'm done with my talk and are there any questions?